All right. Good morning, everyone. Tuning into the Tea Podcast today, we got a cool episode. We're going to be talking with a fellow leadership class of 36 classmate and a financial advisor. His name is Diego Tavares uh, today. So sit back, relax, and we're going to learn a little bit about him and what makes him uh, special in the community. Welcome to this little show of mine. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, sure thing. So um, let's talk a little bit about you. So I, you sent me your bio, and it was uh, rather lengthy. So uh, I used the magic of AI to shorten it for me. And this is essentially what it produced. Uh, and I did shorten it after it shortened it for me. So I have, we are talking with Diogo, a fellow leadership of Lafayette class of 36 classmate, combat veteran and successful financial representative who has dedicated his life to serving others from growing up in Portugal and Canada to graduating from Satin Hall University? Seton Hall. Seton Hall. Okay. Why did I say it? S. And serving in the Army, Diego has a r- rather remarkable journey. And it, there was a little bit more than that, but uh, for the sake of uh, shortening it up and making it more impactful, uh, that's what I got. And then I also said, told the the AI to give me a um, breakdown of your bio because, like I said, it was it was lengthy. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to use the magic and it gave me some breakdowns. So before we go into the, the breakdowns of what it is you are and who you are, just give me a little bit of like a 30 second elevator pitch of just who Diogo is. Well, uh, Diogo is a guy who enjoys serving his community and serving others. Um, been married for, we're going to be married 20, 21 years in May. And so, uh, you know, just love my wife and my family, have three children, uh, a freshman at UL, a junior at Lafayette High School, and then a seventh grader at Milton. And uh, just love the community and what I do. So, yeah, that's awesome. Well, look, man, uh, it's good to be a classmate with you. And uh, one of my, I think all of us were introduced to you by the word duty. Duty. And <laughs> it's a funny word at first, but. Um, going through uh, that particular time of uh, leadership, which we're still in, by the way, but like the very first time meeting you, um, we all thought it was the duty as in poop. Like it was right. a poop. We, thought it, we, <laughs> we thought it was a poop joke. Uh, it turns out it is a word that identifies you and who you are because duty is representative to you as like a serving duty, like you have a duty to serve. And once I realized that, I was like, oh, okay. So he's not just being funny. He's being serious at the same time. But like, and you played, you, you played right into the term duty and it, it made everybody laugh. Um, so I want to know what, what led you to, um, I guess, applying and hopefully getting on to the leadership class. Like what was your, what was your thought going into leadership and what did you think you were going to get out of it? Yeah. So at first I, I really wasn't even going to sign up for it. Um, you know, just life is busy and you've got a ton of other things on your plate and it's like, okay, just one more thing, just another once a month. And, um, you know how that goes, you know? And so uh, I was nominated to, to attend Leadership Lafayette. And I kind of thought through it and asked a lot of questions because I want to make sure that the timing is right. And I think, uh, you know, God leads you to do the things that you don't think you're supposed to do. But I think that God put me in that position to apply and be with a great class. I think, you know, not to, uh, you know, belabor it, but we're the best class ever. I mean, Gosh, let's, let's I know, get right. right? So uh, it's just an amazing class with a great group of individuals and uh, just seeing us evolve in our in our uh, relationships with each other has been great. But 
I decided to apply because I wanted to know more about the community that I live in and what does it offer. Uh, I'm not from Lafayette originally, uh, but this is home now, and we've. Uh, this will be the longest we've lived in one location since I joined the military, and um, so coming up on ten years of living in Lafayette, and this is now home. Our kids are settled and are creating some roots here, and um, we want to give back to this community and, and be a part of it. Uh, as if we had grown up here all our lives. It's crazy that you say you're not from here because I I guess I would have assumed, like you look like a person that would have been from here. I don't know. But um, it looks like you have an ex- a very interesting um, beginning to your life. So I have here that, of course, you were born in Portugal, but you guys fled from, is it Angola, Africa yeah, in Angola. 1975? Yeah, so my family, my mom in particular, and, and my uncles and grandparents lived in Africa um, from about the mid-1950s until 75. And so for them, home was Angola, Africa. And in 75, Angola, uh, along with many other Portuguese colonies, gained independence. Um, it was a time where the whole world, various countries were giving up uh, colonization And so Portugal at the time had Angola was one of its colonies and it had turned it back over to the Angolan government to create their own, you know, to be their own country after 500 something years of being under Portuguese colonization. And so my grandmother and uncles and mom kind of left Angola and went back to Portugal. My mom went back pregnant and uh, my grandfather kind of stayed a little bit thinking that Maybe things would blow over, but things just got worse. And so he paid off his bills and debts and whatever he needed to close out in Angola and basically ended up leaving as well. And uh, they never got a chance to go back to to Angola. So So you guys fled Angola. Well, how old were you then? Were you born yet? No. So my mom was pregnant. We we moved to Portugal to Madeira Island, which is an island off the coast of Morocco, which is where my grandparents were from. And so they moved there. Um, I was born and six months later, we came to the U.S. and joined my grandparents and all of my uncles that were under the age of 18. Um, two of my uncles stayed in Portugal in one state in Angola to serve in the military. Uh, and the other one was in medical school uh, to become a pediatrician. So um, we, I came to the U.S. I was like six months old. Uh, and so really, I've grown up in this country. Yeah, this yeah. is my country. I mean, at six months old, you might as well just say that you're a citizen at this point. I yeah. Mean, so how does, how does that work? So you were born in Portugal, uh, and at six months old, you, you guys moved here. How, did, did you have to apply to get citizenship? Did you have to take a class? Like, because you were too young to know, like, I, I guess I never really thought about how that would work for someone so young. Yeah. So our process was we, we became resident aliens, uh, had applied. My grandmother actually had a brother that was living in Newark, New Jersey. And so he sponsored them to come on over. Um, and our family moved over, moved over here. And then my grandparents took care of paperwork for my mom and I, cause my mom was over the age of 18. So we then came over to the U S uh, to meet up with them in Newark, New Jersey, which is where I grew up most of my life. Um, when my mom, my mother then met my stepdad and he worked for the city of Ottawa. So we moved to Canada for a couple of years and lived in Canada for three years before moving back to new to Newark, New Jersey. My grandparents became U.S. citizens relatively quickly. Um, I think by like 1980, 19, somewhere between 80 and 84, I mean, they were able to vote for Reagan, so uh, <laughs> which was pretty exciting for them to become U.S. citizens. And my mom and I applied for the process as well, which took quite a bit of time. And when I turned 18, I still, the paperwork and the process hadn't gone through. So I ended up filing on my own and became a U.S. citizen during my, essentially my sophomore year of college. Oh, wow. So you were a resident alien until you were. Until I was about 18, 19 years old. Yeah. Wow. Was that difficult? Uh, I didn't think so. I mean, for me, it was pretty simple. And, uh, you know, you asked a question about taking a class and I never had to take a class just because I had been raised here and gone through schooling here in the U.S. that. Uh, I wasn't required to take any exams or anything to become a U.S. citizen. 
Okay, so you didn't have to, like, memorize all the presidents. I mean, you probably would have done that in school. Right. But, like, uh, I, I, we watched, uh, there's a show my wife and I like to watch. It's King of the Hill. And there was a uh, an immigrant there, and he, he was... They, they had, apparently the, the escapade was them going to Mexico and then having to come back, but they lost their uh, passports and they basically had to jump the fence. And uh, so Hank, being a white guy from America, uh, felt weird about it. But the, the immigrant who had, he was from Asia, he said, you guys have it so easy. I had to learn all the presidents and you guys don't have to learn <laughs> anything just to be a U.S. citizen. That's pretty funny, huh? Yeah, yeah. And so I didn't know if it was something as intricate as that or like grueling because, um, th- I mean, so so for you, is it is it hard to become a U.S. citizen? Let's just say someone your age right now coming in out of, out of the country would it be hard for someone to become a U.S. citizen? Like, what would that look like? You know, I'm not sure in terms of the difficulties. I know that the U.S. government kind of looks at what country you're coming from and the background that you have. Um, you know, what can you contribute to society? Yeah. Uh, but I, I couldn't tell you what the process would be at this point. Uh, for me, it was very different because I had grown up in this country. And so I had been educated from kindergarten all the way through, you know, Uh, all of my education in the U.S. So I didn't have to go through, I know that my grandparents did it. They had to go through uh, immigration classes and and take a test and uh, to be able to become U.S. citizens. I'm not sure if my mom ever had to do that or not. She had been here so long. Um, But I know that I I was fortunate enough that where I didn't have to do that. Yeah. Um, Okay, so where did you say you went to high school again? So I went to high school at Oratory Prep in Summit, New Jersey. Uh, It's an all-boys Catholic high school. Um, There were about 42 uh, students in my graduating class, so small Catholic high school that was a preparatory school for for college. Okay, and when, at what point did you guys move? You said you've been here for 10 years. Was that, did you move from there to here, or like, what, what, what was that look like before you like what led up to you moving to Lafayette, Louisiana? Yeah, so uh, you know, did all my schooling in New Jersey. Ended up going to Marist College up in Poughkeepsie for a year, and then transferred to Seton Hall to finish up my college education. Graduated with a bachelor's in political science, and uh, just wanted to get out of college as quickly as possible. You know, like <laughs> we, we're all in a rush to get to the struggle, right? And so, uh, did college in four years, and then went into the military. So I commissioned as an officer into the U.S. Army. Um, and left New Jersey uh, in 1998 after graduating from college and basically traveled all over the world. So my first duty assignment was in Seoul, Korea, or actually just a little north of Seoul, um, and then um, was stationed at Fort Knox, Kentucky, which is where I ended up meeting my wife, Jackie, Um, and then we moved to Fort Stewart, Georgia, and uh, from there, you know, while she stayed back, I deployed for a you know, a couple months to Iraq during uh, the initial invasion in 2003. And then um, from there, we moved to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I taught at the U.S. Army Engineer School and then got stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, uh, deployed to Afghanistan with them, and then um, ended up coming here, was selected to run the ROTC program at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. And so in 2016, I, I ended up retiring from the Army and didn't think we would stay in Lafayette. I mean, my wife and I had our sights set on moving back to Savannah, Georgia. It was a great town. We really enjoyed it. We lived there for five and a half years. Two of our children were born in Georgia. And so we thought we were going to move back there. But something about this community just made me feel like I was back home. You know, walking on the campus of UL uh, was a lot like being at Seton Hall. You didn't. It was a big school. And you didn't necessarily know everybody by name, but you recognized faces and you saw people walking in the same places at the same time every day. And so it just felt very warm and hospitable. And that's what ultimately brought us here and made our decision to stay. Yeah, man, it's so, it's so weird that you say that because, I mean, I always ask people what kept you here like because there's a lot of people that move here and they for whatever reason they stay some of them leave but I feel like people that come here really kind of just wanting to get involved or like maybe have a inkling to get involved in the community or 
feel connected to it. They they either come back or they they never leave, or they find a woman and that keeps them here. Right. Usually, that's a, that's another big contributing factor. Um, and and so it's nice to hear someone with especially the the amount of times that you have moved and around the country and around the world to ultimately settle in Lafayette and call it your home. That's uh, it's really unique. I mean, I'm only from an hour north of here, <laughs> so I feel like uh, nobody cares like to hear from me. Call it. I'm, I'm, I'm practically from the area, but uh, even an hour north, it's different. I mean, you know, they say uh, if you're north of I-10, you're right. a Yankee. Right. And I'm like, God, I live at the moment still north of I-10 in Karen Crow. So I'm like, how far north of I-10 <laughs> is it? Like, Because I, like, um, I feel like I'm a part of the community. But um, So you mentioned being in the Army, and that's a big part of your life. Um, how was it being young like at what point did you go into the military i don't know if you mentioned that but being in being not from originally from this country having to get citizenship uh, like official citizenship at the age of 18 to becoming a military service member um was that weird for you like did it like for me if it, it, it feels like someone that would be from out of the country that would come here and then get citizenship to be in the military to defend the country that they they moved to like i don't know it, there's like some some thoughts there so like what does that look like for you yeah so you know for me uh, you know this this country gave us the opportunity to to live in a place that um basically allowed you a lot of freedoms that maybe you don't have in other places in the world. And so I was very fortunate to get that opportunity to move to the United States of America and to, you know, start a life to, to be able to provide eventually for my family and to create this life that we live today. And so, you know, when I turned 18, I got a letter in the mail because obviously I was a Portuguese citizen. And so yeah. the Portuguese military yeah. at the time was a conscri conscripted army. So I got a letter in the mail saying, hey, man, it's time for you to come back and do your three years of mandatory service. Oh. And so at the time it was like, OK, well, I'm in college. I, you know, I really don't want to go back. And <clears throat> just the thought of having to serve in the military was not appealing. Well, uh, to any degree, like, at well, all? I wouldn't say to any degree, but not going back to another country yeah, to oh, do it. it. And so uh, I've, I've always been involved from a servant standpoint, serving my community, being involved, um, you know, as, as a young kid in different programs and giving back. And so uh, it just felt like I, I had to serve somewhere. And so I found this little program called the ROTC program, the Reserve Officer Training Corps at Seton Hall University. And it seemed like they were doing some really cool stuff. And so got involved with the program and, and really enjoyed it and flourished in it. And um, my mom and dad were not very happy uh, initially <laughs> uh, because, you know, my my mom felt like, okay, we sent you to college to get an education and now you're going to go serve in the military. Like, are you crazy? Yeah, because typically um, the military for some people was reserved to like, that's your last resort. Right. And, like, I and remember. That's, that's how my dad looked at it, right? <laughs> well, I remember being young and getting... Look, I, I'm going to be open and honest here. So I was fired from Walmart. I can never work at Walmart ever again. <laughs> I was young. I was like 18 years old. Uh, I won't go into the story, but just know that I can't work for Walmart ever again in my life. And I got home uh, ashamed at the, the, the possibility of like what that looked like from me in my life. And I told my mom and dad and my dad immediately goes, great. Now you got to go to the army. Great. I'm like, oh God, like that's, that's it. That's it. That's my life. Like, so it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, my, my dad felt like, man, people with your type of education background and, and upbringing, you know, the military for him, cause he served in the Portuguese military was like a last resort. It was like, you went there because there was no other choice. Although at the time being from Portugal, obviously he had to serve. Uh, and so he didn't, he didn't really look at what I was doing as being something really exciting. Now, fast forward a couple of years, and uh, I had earned a, a leadership award through ROTC program, and my parents were there to see me get the award. And I think at that point they realized, okay, this is something he loves to do. He's serving his country. We're going to support him, right? And so I ended up commissioning into the Army uh, at, at the age of like 22, had just turned 22 and uh, went off, right? I mean, I, I spent 
like a couple of weeks at home after graduating from college. And I think my class started on like June 13th at Fort Knox, Kentucky for the armor basic course. So I'd been selected to serve as an armor officer riding around on tanks and went to my initial training at Fort Knox, Kentucky for it um, and spent about four months in Kentucky going through various classes and then ended up going to ranger school and was hurt my first time through ranger school and then got shipped off to Korea. And so, you know, why I served was really because this country had given me an opportunity. And if I was going to serve any, anybody, it was going to be this country. And so I decided to join the U S army, uh, instead of going back to Portugal and doing three years of mandatory service. Wow. All right, so I want to I want to continue the conversation in just a second. I got to get my sponsors mentioned here real quick. So um, you probably have seen the logos on the bottom, but uh, so we got the Music Academy of Acadiana, big sponsor of ours, been sponsoring for several years now. Um, Basically, you can unleash your musical potential with the Music Academy of Acadiana. They're Acadiana's top music music school with classes in piano, guitar, voice, drums, violin, saxophone, flute. And audio production and really all of it. Um, Their experienced instructors cater to students of all ages and musical styles. Graduates have excelled in college and major music competitions. And they've even made it on popular TV shows like American Idol and The Voice. It's founded by UL Lafayette Music School graduate Tim Benson. They've won national recognition and are consistently voted as a top music school since 2016 in Lafayette. So their goal is to make music lessons fun, educational, and to help foster the next generation of musicians and creative thinkers. You can check them out, their website, musicacademyacadiana.com, and on Facebook and all those other places, you know, Instagram, whatnot. And then... We have Chase Group Construction. Chase Group Construction takes the lead and becomes your one point of contact for the entire design build process. So if you're looking to build a new expansion to your business or to build a new building for your business that's just starting, or if you're looking to renovate a space, you can contact Chase Group Construction. They have all, uh, they have a diverse portfolio of projects that range from the medical field to popular restaurants and to multi-unit shopping center developments. You can check out their website at chasegroupconstruction.com and on Facebook, Instagram, and all those other places as well. All right. Appreciate our sponsors. All right. So, Going back to the military, you mentioned you were an armor officer. Yep. And I was going to ask you before you said that what what your role was in the army. So you were riding around in tanks. Were you the guy driving the tank or were you the guy loading the shells or loading the live ammunition into the chamber? Yeah, so I didn't do anything nearly that cool, <laughs> that but cool. Uh, I was a tank commander. And so as an officer, you, you serve as a tank commander on a tank. Um, now, obviously, we understand how to drive because when we go through our training, we we get to drive, we get to load, uh, we get to gun uh, to shoot the, the main gun rounds and stuff. And so it's kind of funny because you have a bunch of officers who, you know, there's a lot of jokes within the military about the dark side. And so you, you have a bunch of officers that are running around in a tank, learning how it operates with an NCO, a, a non-commissioned officer sitting on the top of the turret. We call it the suicide seat. And oh, yeah. it's, it's like bolted on there for them to, you know, kind of train you on how to do that because really inside of a tank, you, there's only four members of a, of a tank crew. And so that NCO is like making fun of you the whole time and kind of, but it, it's a, it's a great experience, but as an officer, you command a, a tank itself. And then as a platoon leader, you've got four tanks within your formation. And so the other, uh, your platoon sergeant, who's normally an E7 or a sergeant first class is running a tank. And then you've got to what they call wingmen and they're normally e6s or staff sergeants that are commanding those tanks so the tank commander is essentially responsible for how the tank maneuvers and what it's doing in given direction to its crew members within that tank as a lieutenant running the platoon i also have responsibility for getting orders from my company commander who's letting me know hey this is what I need your platoon of tanks to do and how I need you to maneuver on the battlefield and battle space to, you know, close with and destroy the enemy. So um, that's kind of like at the lowest level. And then through our careers, we progress. Uh, As an officer, (laughs) you may spend maybe like 
four or five years on a tank. I mean, it's you're wow. not really spending, you know, within a 20 year career, yeah. <clears throat> you may be on a tank like five of those years. Um, and that's if you're in a heavy armor battalion, because if you're in a cav squadron, it may be a different platform or you may be walking or something like that. So, you know, if you're a heavy armor officer, the whole time you're in the military, it's about five years that you'll spend on a tank. Okay. So how long were you in the in the military for? So I did just shy of eighteen years. Unfortunately, uh, I was not selected for promotion to lieutenant colonel and and had to retire. Uh, the army was going through a, a big downsizing uh, during one of the administrations, and so it was just it was time for me to hang it up. And it, I went through about a six eight month period of just being down and trying to figure out what I had done wrong and why I hadn't been selected. And I had done like all the jobs that you were supposed to do in the military and had been through the army's most grueling and toughest leadership schools. And I mean, the army had spent a lot of money to train me, um, to do what I was doing. And so to not get picked up was kind of demoralizing. Yeah. Uh, and so you start asking yourself questions of like, where did I go wrong? What did I do wrong? And I had a pretty clean record throughout my entire military career. I mean, deployed three times and, served as a company commander in Ramadi during one of the toughest periods of time. I want to always tell people that I think I served during three very historic periods within the military, in the military, in the, uh, in a combat role. And so, I mean, I was a, a brigade planner during the initial invasion in Iraq. I was a company commander during the awakening in Ramadi in 2007, eight in Iraq, and then was a brigade planner in 2010, 11 with 101st and planned all of Operation Dragon Strike. I mean, with several other people, but was the lead planner on that operation and, and had the opportunity to name yeah, it. Yeah. So when you don't get selected for something thinking, and I had served in several positions that were above my grade level as a major that I thought, okay, I've, I've done these jobs that I need to do, you know, that are above what I do now and to not get selected, you kind of start going through this process in your mind. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like anything in life you work hard and like, like let's say for example, if you're working in a corporate uh, world, you know, you're trying, you're trying to climb that ladder and you're doing everything you can. And then, you know, you're not selected, but somebody who you feel like you've done equal or more than that one person gets the promotion and you're, yeah, I mean, I get it. It's ever, I think at some point in life, everybody goes through at least one or two of those scenarios. And then they're like, what do I do now? <laughs> like, yeah, I, I used to tell my wife, you know, life in the military is all about timing and it's all about getting to the right place and serving in the right position and having, there's a lot of variables that lead to success and failure. Uh, and you're just one little component of what that all kind of takes. And so my wife has always had this saying, you know, everything happens for a reason. And, and Jackie's pretty smart. And I, I mean, she says that all the time, but it's so true. We don't know what the reason is for something happening or why it's happening. Um, and the way I look at it is, and, and that's what kind of shook me out of my kind of lull is I had to come to the realization that number one, I had to define success for myself. I couldn't allow the army to say that success was doing 20 years and retiring as lieutenant colonel. I had to determine that I had served my country, done what they had asked me to do, and that this chapter was closing and it was time to move on to something else. I mean, the Army's been here over 200 years, you know, yeah. so it'll continue to roll along without me. Um, and so, you know, I went through that. And then the second part was just kind of thinking about what had I gotten selected for promotion I could have potentially deployed again. I could have potentially been killed. I could have potentially moved to a, a, a city that wasn't as good as Lafayette. I may right. not have had all the opportunities that I had here. So everything really does happen for a reason. We don't know what that reason is at the time, but we have to believe through faith that things are going to, it'll all work itself out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So this question that popped into my mind while you were mentioning uh, your deployments and the, the several administrations and going through that. Uh, you can tell me if, if you can't answer it or if there, if it, if you can, great. Um, okay. I, I'm noticing a pattern just in, in, just in several times I've heard people talk about being deployed and this and that. Whenever nine 11 happened, it was, an Afghanistan attack. It was an invasion of Afghanistan. And I don't hear anybody mentioning Afghanistan really 
I hear more people mentioning Iraq. And it was like all about Iraq and taking out the, the leader there, Saddam Hussein. Like what, what, what happened that minimized Afghanistan so much versus Afghanistan, I mean, uh, uh, Iraq being the primary uh, talking point about the, the whole wars that happened after 9-11 or from, from 9-11. Yeah, I think, I think that ultimately, you know, and this is from my opinion and my standpoint, is that, you know, Afghanistan is where the Taliban originated from and what created 9-11, right? I mean, Osama bin Laden was the mastermind behind 9-11 and what happened there. And so we needed to go back to essentially get retribution for what they had done to our people. I mean, we lost over 3,000 people uh, during 9-11 between the Pentagon, uh, the fields of Pennsylvania, and New York City. And so, you know, I think we needed retribution, right? And so Afghanistan was the harboring place of this terrorist organization known as the Taliban. And uh, over time, the Taliban evolved into several other things, Al-Qaeda and right. various other terrorist organizations, which moved into various countries. Now, why we got started in Iraq, you know, other than I think Saddam Hussein just got greedy. You know, I mean, now when you talk to people in Iraq, a lot of citizens and look, I think my time with really getting to know people was in Ramadi, which was a Sunni stronghold. And Saddam was a Sunni Muslim who was from Tikrit and from that area. And Ramadi was kind of hometown for him. Um, the people there felt that Saddam Hussein was a wonderful leader. Okay. Um, now, if you get into Baghdad, very diverse population. I mean, you've got Christians and Muslims and Sunnis and Shia. And I mean, there's, it's a very Western city and it, and it was very Western, um, you know, in the, in the 70s and maybe even into the early 80s. Uh, but Saddam, I guess, maybe just got too greedy and um, kind of, it turned more into a dictator regime. And so I think that there was some harboring of activities that were going on in Iraq, which is what prompted the U.S. government to get involved. Hmm. Um, and so that's how I kind of perceived it. Yeah. Um, and based at the levels that I was at at the time, that's kind of how we looked at it. And it was really just trying to remo remove a regime out of power to put a different regime in that could give the people a better opportunity in life, right? Now, through all my years of deploying and, and being in different places, what I've really realized is that there's really only three things that people truly care about. And it doesn't matter what religion you are, what race, what ethnicity, uh, what gender. I mean, people want to live in a safe and secure environment so that their family can flourish. Uh, people want to have a good job so that they can provide for their family. Uh, and people want to provide their children with the best education possible so that in the future they can be successful themselves. Everything else is really just noise. And I think if, if as communities, as a world, we could figure out that those three things are common amongst everybody, the, the world could probably be a much better place than it is today. Yeah. I think the world could be a better place it, for whatever reason. It, it's, it's, um, it is the way it is. Um, but yeah, you're right. I think that's that's three common things I think everybody wants is to be happy, to be um, uh, financially or at least secure in, in in their life in that respect. And uh, yeah, just just all that good stuff. Uh, God, that's that's pretty that's deep. pretty deep and <laughs> concise at the same time. Uh, I mean, yeah, all the rest is noise. All the politics, all the the celebrity and everything else, everything else is just noise. Um, all right. So to kind of shift a little bit to kind of get closer to where we are today, um, after, after the military and after that, and you had to kind of figure out what was next, it, I, you went to the automotive industry. I did. So, uh, like, tell me about that. What so, does that look like? So it's a funny story. Like, you know, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. Right. And Lafayette, Louisiana is not a hub of fortune 500 companies where Absolutely they not. understand what military folks bring to the table. Um, although I will say that Louisiana has a lot of wonderful benefits for veterans. And I, and I think, uh, it's, that's very important to attracting that type of person. If that's what we want here in Louisiana. Uh, and we can always talk about that later, but, 
Um, so yeah, I, I happened to go to Fort Polk, Louisiana, um, because as I was transitioning out of the military, that's the closest installation to Lafayette. And so had to go turn in my gear and the military's got a transition program that you do your resume and start kind of going through that process of how do you find the next chapter in your life, which, um, that's a funny story within itself, but they happen to have a, a job fair going on the the day that I was there. And so a job fair at the, at the, at the post. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. And so my advisor was like, Hey, look, your resume looks pretty good. I mean, we can make a bunch of copies of it and you can go check this out. And I said, look, no offense, but you guys do a horrible job of placing, <laughs> you know, senior guys like me who are, you know, really need some management jobs. And so I ended up calling my wife up and I'm like, yeah, they invited me to go do this thing. And I, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna go get a haircut. And so I went to get a haircut and on the way back, I started thinking about what my wife had told me. And she said, look, you got nothing to lose. You're already there. You've already driven two and a half hours. Like, go check it out. You never know what might happen. And so I did. I went to check it out and I'm walking around a bunch of tables and I'll never forget it. I, I kind of look up and I'm like, see Mr. Martin sitting there. And I'm like, man, just another truck, truck driving company. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, we kind of made eye contact and, and I said, how you doing? He's like, I'm doing great. I'm just waiting for you to come over here and talk to me. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so <laughs> I'm like, awesome. So I walk over, introduce myself and Mr. Martin's asking me all kinds of questions and what a, what a great man. I mean, he, uh, had served during the Korean war era and, uh, was an officer as well. And so we connected on a lot of different levels, but Mr. Martin kind of was like, look, do you like Lafayette? And I said, I love Lafayette. Like if I could stay there, I'm, I'm good with staying there. And he's like, well, let me tell you what we're doing. And he's going into this. I bought eight acres in Lafayette. It's on exit 100. We want to build a dealership there. I need somebody from the area to kind of run with that and put that plan together and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, that sounds pretty interesting. Well, Mr. Martin just would not give up. Like he would, he, I remember him saying, give me your phone number and your email address. Cause you just moved up to the top of my list based on everything we were talking. And he literally took his pen and wrote in the top of his list, my name, phone number, and email address. And he said, do you have a resume? And I said, no, I, I didn't get any copies of it, but I can email you one. So he gives me his card. And so anyway, he's like calling me like every other day. Hey, have you, have you decided you want to come work for us? And we're just having a great conversation. He comes into Lafayette, takes me to lunch he has a meeting with the, uh, the Daimler guys uh, he, on a site of where our dealership could be. And before you go too far, what, what dealership was that? You said Mr. Martin. Yeah, so this was Martin Truck Center in okay. Lake Charles. Okay. They're, they own a, they've been in business over 50 years. Mr. Martin started the dealership back in 1965 as a GM uh, dealer, was in the heavy truck business. And when GM got out of the heavy truck, he kept the GM brand with GMC and and. Pontiac, um, and then, uh, ended up also getting a Freightliner dealership and, and a Suzu as well. Okay. <clears throat> so he loved heavy trucks. That was like his passion. And so I went to work for them. You know, I was driving back and forth to Lake Charles every day from here, but, uh, but yeah, so phenomenal man, uh, really enjoyed it, but he would invite me to like these meetings with the Daimler guys. And I hadn't even been hired on yet. It was, it, and it was funny cause he would like, tell the Daimler guys, well, if I can just get this guy to come work for me, we'll be, we'll be doing okay. And so I love Mr. Martin, uh, went to work for him and, uh, about a year, about a year into my working for him, he ended up passing away. Mm. Um, and so, which was real sad, uh, but I tried to keep the business going in the direction that Mr. Martin had kind of had that vision. And so we went through a lot of, before he even passed away, we went through a lot of planning. I built a business plan to build a dealership here in Lafayette, which would have been a great location because you're at the crossroads of Louisiana. Yeah. I mean, I-10, 49, 90. Um, and so anyway, Daimler basically came back and said, hey, look, this is like one of the best business plans we've ever seen, but we need you guys to fix some things in Lake Charles before we authorize this next move. And so I'm like, okay. So Mr. Martin sends me to the dealer Academy. And as I started the dealer Academy, he ends up passing away. So finished the dealer Academy and stayed with the company for another two years. And it, it just wasn't working out and it was time for me to move on. And I had been offered a 
job to come work in the car business here in Lafayette. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, retiring from the army, like there's only two things you're good at and nobody's hiring legally for the first. So, uh, I had to kind of figure out what I was going to do. So the automotive business just seemed like what my cup of tea, no pun intended, but, uh, ended up working for a car dealership and I didn't last very long, about five or six months. I got fired. I just saw some things that I, I didn't feel good with. Yeah. Um, and so shared those with the people that needed to be shared with. And, you know, I went from being like the best thing since sliced bread to being the biggest piece of crap ever. And so, uh, so I, I left that, you know, I got fired. Yeah. Uh, it, my paperwork says reduction in force, but I got fired is really what happened. And so I didn't know what to do next. But obviously, we had decided we were going to stay in Lafayette. We had bought our forever piece of property. My kids were doing well. And it was like, okay, well, gotta I got to figure something out. Yeah. So I applied to like, I don't know, 152 jobs. Like I was just applying for jobs left and right. Because I knew that whatever this was next was really just going to be a transitionary period. And uh, went to work for a dealership. And the general manager said, Diogo, is this really what you want to do? And I said, no, no, it's not. <laughs> but, uh, but unfortunately, my resume, this is what it says I can do. And so I, I just need to feed my family and pay the bills. And he said, well, I, do you know Kay McNutt? And Kay was Mr. Martin's daughter. And I said, yeah, I know her really well. And he said, well, I know her really well. Do you mind if I give her a call? And I said, no, go right ahead. So he he called her up and she was like, look, you'd be stupid not to hire this guy. So I went to work for them and worked for them for about a year. That general manager ended up leaving. I, I just, the car business just was not for me. The, the ethics of it, the way it works, right. I was ready for something <clears throat> else. So luckily uh, I had a client come in that was in the financial business and we struck up a conversation and one thing kind of led to another. All right. So you get out of the automotive industry, going into the financial industry. Uh, about what year was that transition for you? Yeah. So 2020, uh, COVID had happened and we were kind of in the middle of COVID and uh, it was like, okay, well, if we're going to make a jump, now's kind of the time to do it. Wow. So you were in the automotive industry all, pretty much all of t- like the 2010 a decade? So, no. So, I, I retired from the Army 2016, okay. went to work for oh, Martin it. Truck Center right after that, and then was in the tr- in the car automotive industry until, Up until 2020. 2020. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And so, did you have any experience in financial anything? Like, it, it, I, from just all the discussions so far, it doesn't sound like there was any financial <laughs> um, interest at all in the beginning. So... How did, like, what did that look like for you going into financial, uh, I guess, as a financial advisor? um, Did you feel qualified for that? Like, like, being honest, I mean, obviously you're qualified because you seem to be doing well with it. No, I I really did not. Uh, I never saw myself in the industry. You know, my mom was a financial advisor uh, for a big bank in New Jersey. My dad had been in the mortgage business. Now, my grandfather was in banking and insurance. And so my family was in that business, in the financial services industry. Um, And short of like I had taught Financial Peace University to a bunch of soldiers when we were deployed to make sure that they were using their money correctly and budgeting and doing all that stuff and educating my soldiers on writing checks and balancing checkbooks and making sure that they were saving a little bit at, you know, the emergency fund and helped soldiers understand what a 529 was and stuff like that as a commander. That's really about all my financial experience, right? (laughs) Other than my wife and I own several properties all over the country that we rent out. So I understood how to run a business and how to run your checkbook the right way. Um, And so that's kind of the experience that I had. But the fortunate thing is that if you care about helping people and doing the right thing, you know, these, a lot of companies will train you and teach you the things that you need to know. And so Northwestern Mutual took, I mean, they're a Fortune 90 company. Um, They have a great training plan. You start off uh, from a life and health standpoint, and then you start learning the investment side and full financial plan, comprehensive planning and working with people to really look from a 30,000 view level and kind of dial it down to if you want to retire by this age with this much money a month, can you do it? And if not, there's really only a couple of answers. Either you're going to work longer, you're going to live on less, or we need to start doing something today, right? And so 
uh, you learn all those things, but it's all about the relationship with people because financial advisors really, they're not watching the stock market and seeing the tickers go up and down and moving things around. I mean, we have people that are doing that for us in the background. We're really just sitting down with clients and getting to hear their story and developing a relationship and finding out what exactly is it that they're looking to achieve and then building a plan around their goals. Right. Gotcha. So okay. that's how I kind of got into it and yeah. what I do. Yeah. That's cool. All right. So we're at about 45 minutes. Uh, it moved pretty quick, man. I didn't it always that does. It always <laughs> does. Um, I kind of want to start closing up. So you said you were married. Do you want to, um, Talk a little bit about your family. I know you kind of mentioned it a little bit in the beginning. Um, and then kind of wrap it up with what do you hope to see come out of your experience with Leadership Lafayette? Yeah, so love my family. Uh, my wife, probably one of the most supportive women uh, that I've ever met. And, uh, you know, she was kind of introverted and, you know, small town yeah. kind of thought process, but she's so evolved. And I mean, she has, you know, I don't think military spouses really get the credit that they deserve. I mean, their, their military service member deploys for a year at a time is in the field is gone. And that spouse has got to make all these decisions and have to take the kids to school and oh, have yeah. to and that's pay the bills. Work. Yeah. And so it's funny because our neighbor one time saw my wife mowing the grass and he was laughing because he'd never seen a woman mow the grass. And my wife was like, what's so funny? Like, <laughs> I mean, if he's not home to do it, somebody's got to do yeah. it and I'm not paying somebody to do it. So, uh, but no, my wife has been super supportive. Um, She's been kind of my sounding board and making sure that I, she truly is my best friend. She makes sure that I am grounded and doing all the right things in life. And sometimes she's like, even though she's quiet, she'll like pull me aside and be like, that was probably a stupid move right there. So, <laughs> um, but no, we just have such a great love and a great relationship. Um, and, uh, and then obviously three children, uh, my oldest Caleb is a, is a freshman at UL and studying civil engineering and he's just a really good kid and. He's going, he started his own little DJ business now and oh, nice. kind of doing that. So learning that. So um, civil engineering and DJ. Yeah. And, he, right. and, he, and he's working for the bus depot, driving buses. That's <laughs> awesome though, yeah. man. So he's a, he's a hard worker, maybe not at home, but he's a hard worker it's uh, always the outside. Case. Like I, my, my, if you ask my dad, I wasn't a hard worker at home. Yeah. yeah I would true. leave the lawnmower in the middle of the yard when it ran out of gas and my, I would go back in on the computer and my dad would be like, what are you doing? The, the lawnmower just sitting out there. I said, it ran out of gas. Yeah. And he's like, you could have just put more. I'm like, man. I didn't think about that. Yeah, no, it's funny. And then my middle daughter, uh, Megan, she goes to Lafayette High. Shout out. She just, uh, she just won e-board president nice. for the school. So she's pretty stoked about that. But she's a super bright kid. Um, you know, I, she wants to go into the medical field, uh, some type of doctor. Great place she to had, do it here. She hasn't figured it quite out yet. But at one point, she wanted to be a neonatal cardiologist. Wow. So she's got super sights set out on doing things. But uh phenomenal kid. And then my little one is just uh, bright. Uh, Morgan is in seventh grade and she goes to Milton and she uh, loves soccer and loves hanging out with her friends. And uh, yeah. but she's super like intelligent as well. Bit, yeah. yeah. So I'm pretty fortunate. Got a great family. Uh, I really can't complain. I think the only thing that we miss out on is not having our parents and our extended family. I mean, cause we're the only ones here. So yeah, that's um, good. I'm sure that's hard. Yeah. It's been kind of tough, but, but not too bad. And to answer your second question, like, what do I expect out of Leadership Lafayette? It's uh, it's eye opening. Uh, it's been great to see the things that you don't know to kind of get the drapes pulled back a little yeah. bit and get to see really how the city operates and that we're all members of a community. And if we all just do our little part and our little piece, how can we make our community better? Right? How do we make I mean, there's no doubt that Lafayette is a shining gem of Louisiana. I mean, yeah, we just need a little polishing here and there. Yeah. And I mean, look, every town has got its issues. I've, yep. I've lived in several places all over the world. And what I tell people is if you've never left here, you you don't know how truly how good you have it. The grass isn't greener on the other side. It's just different grass. Um, and so how do we make things better here in Lafayette to really grow our community, make it, uh, make it a great place to live, raise a family, get educated. Uh, really, you know, you hear everybody say Lafayette's this big, small town, you yep. know, it's like, you've got everything you need here. 
Uh, you don't really have to leave Lafayette to to, really to go do stuff or go buy things or except you know, unless you want to go to the beach, then right, you do right, leave. right. <laughs> but uh, but other than that, I mean, everything is here, and so yeah. how do we attract folks to put back into this community? So I'm amazed. You know, Leadership Lafayette has allowed us to meet several CEOs, and I guess I can give them a shout out. But meeting you know people like Matt Stuller and, and meeting people like Charles Edwards and the folks that and and Corey McCoy and just hearing their story and how they love their community and really could have moved anywhere, anywhere yeah. to, to run their businesses. But they've decided that Lafayette is home and the impact of what they've created for this community, for this region has just been phenomenal. So the, the question as we get out of leadership Lafayette is how do we contribute to making the impact, you know, cause all it takes is just to make a small impact and it'll have rippling effects. So that's what I think I, I hope we get out of leadership Lafayette and then the relationships have been phenomenal. Yeah, so. that's great. Yeah. Um, I hope the same thing, man. I, I, I echo that sentiment. And then, yeah, you said the relationships. I mean, there are, uh, I, if I'm correct, 34 people, yeah, we have 34 in, folks yeah. in our class. That's a lot of people. And I remember, uh, and I'm pretty sure you remember too, because that's the time where duty was introduced. Yeah. <laughs> um, having to learn everybody's names was quite the most interesting thing that I've ever been through. I've, I've been in, obviously I've been in school, having to learn names was never a thing that was like the first thing that we kind of did. We just kind of learned names as we go and kind of like learned who was sitting by you. And then right. you gradually kind of expanded your, your net from there. Um, the, from the gate, man, we had to learn 33 other people's <laughs> names and I, I still, to this day, I'm, I'm so surprised that me being so bad at names can, after that day, almost look at one, each person and be, and just tell them what their name is. Yeah. I'm like, what world did that, did I think that that would actually work? It's just so, I mean, that's a small part of leadership at Lafayette, obviously, but just, it's neat to kind of get to know different people and learn their backgrounds. And obviously I met you there. So yeah. this is kind of part of me integrating leadership into my, my daily uh, routines and kind of exploring and going deeper with certain people. So uh, no, this has been awesome. And you know, I think what Ben's referring to is, you know, we, we had to sit in a circle and everybody had to state their name and then something that describes them, a word that describes them using the first initial of their first name. Yeah. So, so obviously when it got to me, you know, how many words are there with the letter D? I right. mean, I could have used like dedicated or something, but I didn't think about that. So at the time duty popped into my head and that's what it went with. But, uh, but yeah, it's amazing how that little exercise really shortly after that exercise, like we knew everybody in the yeah. class. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. Really cool stuff. Well, Diogo, I know um, you have to get running because we're all busy around here, but I want to say again, thank you for uh, accepting my invite to come on Anytime. and talking Loved about it. what you got. And I, I love to hear about your, your, your journey coming into Lafayette and going through, you know, moving so much in the military and having all these job changes, because what I think that does is helps people that are listening. And like, let's say someone has met you and they, they, they view you as this super well polished, never gone through any struggles in your life type of guy to realizing like, wow, he went through several different things in his life, several moves and different job training, job scenarios and like not being, promoted in this and ha getting fired from that. Like, it's just, it's nice to be able to get down to the real roots of how people live and how they ultimately rise up and become successful. Yeah. Look, Ben, I've, I've, I appreciate you having me on. I've, I've enjoyed this. I would do it again in a heartbeat if you need somebody. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun and you're absolutely correct. Uh, you know, from the inside looking out, how does this community continue to welcome people who aren't necessarily originally from here and from an outside looking in, how do we attract people to come here and make Lafayette even better and, and offer our citizens a, a lot more than what we have today? Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Diogo, glad to have you on, man. I, I, and I'm glad you enjoyed it and I did too. It was fun. And I look forward to our, uh, year of leadership Lafayette. That's still, uh, on its way. That's right. And, right. and then some. Yep. All right. Have a good one, Diego. You too.